30 minutes. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you everybody uh, to uh, be here this early. Um, I would like, so my name is um, uh, Dr. Michael Krause. I'm the leadership chair for addiction research at the University of British Columbia. And I am in charge of the program uh, and for uh, these conferences uh, we organized. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that our group and uh, UBC is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam uh, people. Given that this conference is virtual, we have people joining us from over 29 countries around the world today. We would like to acknowledge and express gratitude to the traditional caretakers of the lands that all of you are joining in from today. It is my great pleasure um, now to introduce the uh, Minister Sheila Malcolmson uh, for mental health and substance use in uh, British Columbia. Uh, she is also vice chair of the cabinet working group for mental health, addiction and homelessness and cabinet committee of social initiatives. She was already joining us um, uh, last year, and it is a great pleasure to have you again, Minister, and we really appreciate that you are that fresh and early with us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Michael, and thank you to UBC for bringing us together. I'm just so honored to be here joining you from the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. I, I'm here in the legislature and uh, very honored to be among this uh, esteemed panel. And uh, my um, thanks and greetings to people from all over the world who I understand are, are joining to learn together. I honor the tragic and unprecedented loss of lives from the toxic drug supply. This has been a crisis worsened by COVID and the measures to contain it and the terrible grief of families and frontline workers, people that have worked so hard to save lives at this just really terrible time. It's, um, it's an unspeakable loss. And I recognize that, that grief runs through so much of, of your work. Um, so I'm especially grateful that you all are here to, to try to bring that change that we need, that we're working hard to bring ourselves as a government. We found when we formed government in 2017 that treatment and recovery approaches and systems services had, had been neglected for more than a decade. What services did exist were fragmented and that's work that we're focused on every day is trying to bring those back together. We came from a time in British Columbia when there had been a decision made in the past uh, by um, another government to slash funding for the services that supported the most vulnerable people in our province, most particularly youth at risk. Um, and that has left a generation of young people with substance use disorders, um, with mental health challenges that, who had been left to fend for themselves. And that is something that we see every day in our communities, um, a lot of tragedy and, um, and a lot of inheritance of of, of pe young people that were let down. We are working to build back that comprehensive system of care, aiming to transform mental health and addictions care by building a system that really meets people where they are uh, with compassion, with a trauma-informed approach, and by bringing mental health and substance use care fully within the healthcare system where it belongs. I never underestimate how much more we have to do and, and what an enormous and vital task that is. I know that today the focus of your conference is overdose among youth. And that was at the forefront, young people at the forefront of our province's long-term plan for building up that system of care that was initiated by my friend and predecessor, Judy Darcy, who was the first minister of mental health and addictions in Canada. We call that the pathway to hope and children and youth are at the forefront of it. 
we know that early intervention can stop small problems be from becoming larger ones down the road. And the earlier that we provide support, the better the outcomes. Creating that system though is complicated and the answers are not always straightforward. So I'm gonna make, talk in a little bit more detail about one of the challenging issues that my ministry has been grappling with since it was created five years ago. That's how to provide care for youth immediately following an overdose. Um, in 2020, the first Minister of Mental Health and Addictions proposed amendments to the Mental Health Act that would have allowed youth admitted to hospital following a life-threatening overdose to be admitted for stabilization care for up to 48 hours or until their decision-making capacity had returned. However, what was intended as a way to keep youth safe following an overdose and, and giving them the opportunity to be connected to care um, ended up being criticized by many youth advocates. There were concerns about the involuntary nature of the approach and whether it would achieve the desired outcomes. The bill did not contemplate forced treatment, but involuntary admission as a way to have the opportunity to connect people with treatment. Um, but there were you know, very clear concerns about whether it would actually achieve the desired outcomes. And this was particularly clear from Indigenous voices who were understandably critical about anything that might involve holding children against their will, even if it was to connect them with care. And honestly, after the revelations last summer of the confirmation of discoveries of young people um, who had been in residential schools, having unmarked graves discovered that just made it even more clear um, that this was extremely triggering and I understand that. Uh, another criticism was that there were not enough voluntary services for youth with substance use challenges post-discharge. Others raised the risk of overdose, uh, over, raised the prospect of overdose risk from reduced tolerance after a hospital stay. So since being appointed me as minister in late 2020, I've been working collaboratively with many key partners and experts to ensure a culturally safe and trauma-informed response for youth following overdose. And we've been focused on building up the voluntary system of care for youth in all regions of the province. We've been investing in youth mental health services. We're doubling youth substance use and treatment and recovery beds for a total of 142 publicly funded youth beds operating in BC, um, including 20 new youth beds at the Chilliwack uh, Traverse facility. Really a um, beautiful and inspiring place if anybody has an opportunity to visit it. Um, we're also funding counseling and outreach teams through groups like Dan's Legacy that help connect youth with mental health and substance use supports following an overdose. And that's being piloted in four lower mainland hospitals right now. We're also expanding early psychosis intervention by adding 100 new full-time professionals throughout the province. We're also expanding the network of foundry centers for a total of 23 of those integrated health and wellness centers for young people ages 12 to 24, while we strengthen the Foundry BC virtual app. So there's access to drop-in counseling, virtual appointments, peer support, and a lot of it focused around around addictions um, counseling. We also know it's essential to bolster support for youth in school. And that's why we're working with Ministry of Education to provide um, nearly $175 million for mental health support. The mental health in school strategy embeds mental health and substance use with students throughout the education system and expands on the foundation of our plan, the pathway to hope. Uh, in conclusion, we're addressing and working hard every day to address the toxic drug crisis, particularly as it affects young people from every angle. And we do that with a partnership with many, many uh, brave and committed people. And we do it with full humility about how much work there is ahead of us, how big a task it is, um, and how much is at stake. Uh, we know there's more to do. We look forward to learning from you and working with uh, many of you and Again, um, gratitude for inviting me to, to open um, your conversations today and thank you for the work and conversations ahead. Thanks so much, uh, Minister Markinson. Thank you for taking the time. Um, and following, we all know that an important partner in uh, dealing with a big 
problems you already mentioned are, are uh, Canadian universities. Uh, this event is um, supported by the three biggest uh, universities in Canada. One of them is the University of British Columbia, and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Lakshmi Yatham as the head of psychiatry at UBC, who is also uh, welcoming our event today. The floor is yours, Lakshmi. Thanks very much, uh, Michael, for uh, for that introduction. And um, uh, let me take this opportunity, uh, first of all, to uh, congratulate you uh, for your uh, leadership uh, in organizing uh, this uh, this conference. Uh, it looks like uh, it's becoming very rapidly a premier uh, international uh, conference, which is sort of attracting delegates uh, from around the world. And I, as I heard, uh, this conference has a resistance from over uh, 25 uh, countries uh, from, uh, from around the world. So welcome to colleagues that have joined uh, this conference, not only from BC, but uh, from other parts of Canada, as well as from uh, countries uh, around the world. So Michael, uh, the theme uh, that you had chosen uh, for this uh, conference, uh, let's talk over, uh, over those deaths, is uh, highly um, critically uh, important uh, given uh, over those deaths uh, have become a, a public health uh, crisis in many parts of the world, including uh, in, uh, in British Columbia. And if one uh, looks at the, the trajectory of these uh, overdose uh, deaths, um, it's not going to be um, too long before uh, they overtake uh, motor vehicle accidents as the leading causes of uh, death in, in youth, uh, which is uh, an incredibly uh, frightening uh, thought. So, uh, so I guess is, you know, how, how do we understand uh, this, uh, this um, uh, public health uh, crisis and these overdose deaths, uh, particularly among, among the youth? Um, what are uh, some of the uh, factors that put uh, the youth at high risk uh, for these overdose uh, deaths? Uh, what are uh, some of the tools, uh, evidence-based tools, I should say, that are at our disposal to uh, prevent or minimize uh, youth uh, from developing uh, substance use disorders and thus putting them at risk uh, for these uh, overdose uh, deaths? Uh, how can we uh, personalize um, treatment uh, strategies to reduce the risk? And how do we create a, a continuum of care that treats uh, each youth as a unique uh, individual? Because we know every person uh, is different. The choices that they make are different. The treatment options that they might benefit from might be different. So how do we create a continuum of care that provides uh, low or no barrier access uh, to care uh, and treatment that's tailored to, to the individual uh, needs. Now, Minister Mal Malcolmson has already spoken um, about uh, some of the strategies the current government is uh, implementing to uh, provide that continuum of care. Uh, she also acknowledged uh, this is a very uh, complex uh, challenge. Uh, I will say to you, though, that you have assembled uh, an outstanding uh, team of experts uh, to be speakers at this conference, who I hope uh, will be able to dialogue and provide answers to uh, some of those questions uh, that, I'm, uh, that I have raised. I do think, given uh, the, the, uh, some of the topics that are going to be covered uh, as a part of this conference, uh, I, I believe that this is going to be incredibly helpful and pragmatic uh, because you also have a number of uh, workshops as well uh, for clinicians uh, that are helping uh, youth and, and others with substance use and those that are at risk for overdose deaths on a daily basis. So this is going to be tremendously helpful for clinicians around the world. I also think uh, it's going to be uh, incredibly helpful for uh, clients uh, with substance use issues and also for their family members as well, because 
as I see the program, uh, it's also going to provide uh, some insights uh, to them as to what do we know about these issues and how can they access uh, the care that, that might be needed to either uh, help themselves or, or their uh, loved ones. Uh, moving forward, though, uh, looking to the feature, uh, again, I'm not an expert in substance use disorders or overdose deaths for that matter, uh, but as you know, and as we all know, uh, psychiatry is moving uh, towards that personalized care, and I think that approach uh, is probably critical uh, in helping uh, youth that are at uh, risk or overdose deaths as well, because as we say, uh, each person is going to be unique, and the treatment strategies uh, that we apply will have to be tailored uh, to the needs of uh, each individual. And when those strategies could be ranging anywhere from whether they're harm reduction strategies, abstinence, whatever that might be, but we have to keep in mind what does the individual want and work with that person to, um, to uh, address their, their care needs. Um, I should also say a little bit about the research uh, because uh, this is an area that uh, I would say is neglected. Uh, we really need to invest. I know the minister talked about uh, investing in, in services, but I think uh, we also need our governments to invest uh, in research because there are so many areas where we know uh, very little uh, about how to effectively uh, provide help for, uh, for people with some of these disorders. A good example, of course, is uh, stimulant use disorder, where we have literally no proven or approved uh, treatments. And also uh, for people with uh, concurrent disorders, uh, that is, you know, people with substance use disorder and various uh, major uh, psychiatric illnesses, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety disorders, uh, we see these people uh, uh, very commonly, more than half the people that we see in our psychiatric practice uh, have concurrent disorders. And yet we know so little about how to effectively manage or offer help or free for people that have both of those uh, disorders. So I urge uh, our governments and the ministries not only invest in uh, uh, strengthening uh, the uh, services and care continuum, but also think about uh, investing uh, in, uh, in research uh, to provide answers to some of those, uh, those questions. Uh, I know the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions has set up a, a research uh, policy advisory committee whose task is to uh, identify uh, research priorities in mental health uh, within BC. Uh, but once those are identified, uh, the ministry also needs to think about um, investing dollars uh, to support uh, that research. And I'll say, and uh, Michael, you probably know this already, and uh, many of our, our faculty members may already know this, uh, from the uh, UBC Department of Psychiatry perspective, uh, recently our uh, executive uh, endorsed uh, creating uh, an addiction psychiatry division because I think uh, the, uh, the executive and the leadership of the department recognizes uh, this is an area that deserves increasing attention uh, in terms of uh, allocating uh, resources to, uh, to support uh, research. So the, the department and also the Institute of Mental Health will do its part or their part uh, in supporting research. Um, we also are hoping to fundraise uh, to create a chair uh, that's uh, going to focus on uh, youth uh, substance use uh, concurrent disorders issues. So we're going to be starting a fundraising campaign to do that. So the department will be doing uh, lots of things uh, to support uh, research uh, in this area. So with that, uh, Michael, let me uh, conclude again uh, by uh, thanking you for, uh, for your leadership in putting this uh, conference together and also uh, giving me an opportunity to share uh, some of my uh, thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Lakshmi. And um, some very important bullet points to follow up on. <laughs> an, an important partner in uh, this work, especially if we talk about use, is um, the uh, BC Ch uh, Children's Hospital. And um, uh, we are very happy again this year 
to do our conference in collaboration also with um, the VC Children's Hospital with even more active involvement. Uh, Dr. Jana Davidson is the lead physician for uh, uh, the hospital and is uh, very welcome to welcome the conference again. And uh, uh, the floor is yours, Jana. Thank you, Michael. It's an honor to be here and provide some opening remarks for this conference, which I note is growing and, and there's a, a tremendous uh, engagement. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that today we're coming from together from a number of ancestral, traditional and unceded territories. And I have the privilege of joining you from the traditional and ancestral territories of the Tawasan First Nation. I'd like to acknowledge the homelands and recognize and respect indigenous people as the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island and the traditional knowledge keepers since time immemorial. As a, an invited third generation white settler, to these lands. Uh, I acknowledge that colonial attempts at erasure of Indigenous peoples and their cultures and the resultant intergenerational trauma has resulted in the disproportionate impact of the overdose crisis on Indigenous peoples. Hmm. And look forward to the continued work of those attending this conference to um, work toward solutions and uh, reconciliation with our Indigenous peoples and Indigenous peoples around the world. You know, though this event is virtual, I can feel the energy already um, uh, of those that are in attendance and the compassion uh, of the attendees in, in addressing uh, this over, you know, this continued overdose crisis um, and, and hope that uh, an end to it uh, is in our collective sight. Uh, the dual pandemic nature of COVID-19 and the public health overdose and toxic drug supply emergency have intersected with devastating results, um, particularly for our young people. Um, in British Columbia, we've had uh, over 2,232 fatal overdoses related to illicit drug toxicity in 2021 alone, the highest number of overdose deaths ever in this province. Uh, the person toll uh, that is staggering and equates to seven people per day in British Columbia being lost to a, illicit drug toxicity. It's hard to fathom that. Um, from the start of the COVID-19 pandemic to January 2022, illicit drug toxicity deaths are the third leading cause of death among youth under 19 years of age and the leading cause of death among young adults from 19 to 39. In 2021 alone, we lost 355 youth under 29 years old to the ongoing crisis. It's heartbreaking uh, to contemplate the lost potential and contributions that we won't have from these young people who are no longer with us. And it's the truly the challenge of our time to find the set of solutions that will effectively end the crisis. At BC Children's and Women's Hospitals, um, I have the, fortunate, uh, the fortune to lead and work alongside a really dedicated team of healthcare leaders, uh, physicians, medical staff, and clinical teams committed to addressing mental health and substance use needs of children, youth, and families. Um, and I thought I'd just provide a, a, a an overview of, of some of the programs that have been in place uh, that we look to expand on. One of our leading BC Children's Hospital programs, the COMPASS program, provides uh, community care providers with information, advice, and resources throughout British Columbia to deliver evidence-informed mental health and substance use care for children and families closer to home, uh, more upstream, uh, and uh, following the success of Compass, uh, children, BC Children's and Women's Hospital uh, has newly developed an addiction medicine consult service to meet the needs of people using substances across the campus with our particular patient populations, which are youth and women. The Substance Use Response and Facilitation, or SURF team, was launched earlier this year uh, to provide specialized consultation to inpatient medical programs across both hospitals and is an interdisciplinary team comprised of physicians, uh, an addictive nurse, 
and social workers with expertise in substance use, uh, which will expand soon to BC Children's Hospital Emergency Department uh, in the near future. We hope that this service is gonna meet the goals of identifying and assessing children and youth with substance use concerns, providing timely and much needed holistic support to address their needs and the needs of their families. We're also focusing our efforts to address the missing middle in our care continuum for youth and young adults. People in the missing middle uh, are often too unwell for community-based mental health and addictions care. Uh, but not unwell enough for hospital and tertiary services, and often present to emergency departments, which could have been avoided with sufficient community care, um, and leave the emergency department without adequate and assertive follow-up. And uh, Minister Malcolmson reflected this in in some, you know, the lack of of upstream services that we need. In addition to collaborating with young people, families and providers to identify opportunities for systems improvements, uh, that this project is exploring better options to support young people in crisis through short stay emergency triage services, which would include step down care to support successful transition to community addictions and step up care when longer term addiction supports required. The examples um, that I've shared today um, align and amplify um, the work taking place under a pathway to hope um, and are about innovation and adaptation to establish services that address the needs of children and youth. I recognize that there's much, much more work that we need to do. And I know that today's conference and program, which is focused on early risk and early intervention, um, uh, related to uh, stopping the overdose crisis and the fatal effects on youth. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from the great presenters uh, from across uh, this province and around the world uh, regarding the context of the overdose crisis, the emerging issues and risks, and the management of overdoses, uh, along with treatment approaches and modalities. Um, this is a collective learning opportunity for all of us um, to share, collaborate, and catalyze change uh, locally, uh, regionally, nationally, and internationally. Um, we're in the right space at the right time uh, to advance this uh, really important and life-saving uh, work. And I'd like to thank you uh, for your leadership in, in bringing not only the speakers and panels together, but providing the space for the attendees to join together in that collaboration uh, towards solutions for, for this uh, uh, tragic uh, emergency that we face today. Thank you so much, Yana. Um, let me hand uh, over to um, Sarah. Sarah Fujak is um, a co-sponsor of our event, uh, was also last year, and she is the founder and director of the Student Recovery Community. And beside that, a really inspiring speaker and uh, a, a driver of um, a very unique uh, community at, a, at the University of British Columbia. Sarah, please uh, feel free to welcome the conference and say a few words. Thanks, Michael, for that intro and for inviting me here to share this space with all of you. I'm joining today from the stolen lands of the Hunkaminam and Sohokmish speaking people. I'm a person with living experience of substance use, addiction, and recovery. For me, navigating undergraduate and then graduate school was extremely difficult, not only as a person in active addiction, but even more so as a person in early recovery. As a young student, I just wanted to connect with other students, but I couldn't find anyone who was going through what I was at school and when I looked for supports in the community, I didn't relate at the time because like I said, I just wanted to connect with my fellow students. It wasn't until much later in life, I would learn that many students were experiencing similar struggles, but because of how much stigma there was and continues to be today, 
we were all going through it in isolation and secrecy. Later, when I was working at, as a social worker at a large university in the US, I came across what was called a collegiate recovery community for the first time. Seeing it honestly brought tears to my eyes because it was the first physical acknowledgement within a post-secondary setting that represented an awareness and understanding of the struggles I had to navigate on my own and alone. Fast forward to 2017 when I moved to Vancouver to pursue my doctorate at UBC. It was difficult to find out there were no supports for students navigating substance use issues and recovery. Not just at UBC, but there weren't supports in post-secondary settings anywhere in Canada. Being from the US, I didn't want to presume I knew what students in Canada or Vancouver at UBC needed just based on my own experience. So I got a small grant to conduct a study to others understand whether students with lived and living experience of addiction and recovery felt supported. What I learned from the study was that those students did not feel supported. In fact, they were experiencing high rates of isolation, social exclusion, depression, anxiety, and for some chronic suicidal ideation. Next, I asked this group of students for their recommendations based on their very real and important lived experiences. What could UBC do to help them feel included, connected, healthy, and successful? It was their recommendations which resulted in the development of the first student recovery community in Canada, known as the SRC for short. The SRC is a community embedded in the campus culture that has been developed and cultivated by and for students with living experience of substance use issues, addiction, and or recovery. Importantly, we are a community where harm reduction and sobriety coexist. There is no hierarchy discerning one pathway as quote unquote better or worse. Each student is free to learn about and explore any and all pathways with no judgment or pressure to do anything other than what feels best for them. At the SRC, we focus on cultivating connection and community, period. Just to name a few things we have going on at the SRC, we offer peer support meetings, drop-in hours, one-on-one -on -one peer mentorship, fun activities, monthly community gatherings. We have a book club, a blog project built entirely by SRC members that addresses stigma and reframes and reclaims what it means to be in recovery. We have a physical space embedded within the campus culture where all SRC participants have key card access to the space. So it can serve as a respite anytime it's needed because after all, post-secondary settings in their current state have been identified as highly recovery hostile environments. I want to emphasize again, harm reduction and sobriety coexist at the SRC. Amidst a backdrop of what some to refer, refer to as an addiction civil war in North America, we are a space that is living proof of cultivating a space between, a respite amongst the chaos where all approaches come together in harmony and mutual respect. We believe this is the way forward. After only two and a half years, we already have close to 100 participants at the SRC. This alone speaks to the value of what we have created. In addition, our incredible program coordinator, Jennifer Doyle, has been instrumental in expanding our services to support students navigating eating disorders and disordered eating. We also have what we call coffee bike outreach, where we take our SRC cargo bike around campus handing out free coffee and tea in exchange for a simple conversation about substance use health, addiction, and recovery on campus. In addition, our members provide training to faculty, staff, and students interested in being allies to our community. Our approach is to ensure everyone recalls that allyship is not a noun, but an action word. We, those of us with lived and living experience are the true experts of our own lives. It's important no matter one's degrees, credentials, accolades, that each of us remembers this now and always. 
Our outreach efforts are literally shifting the campus culture when it comes to reducing stigma and raising awareness about these important topics. And we're now assisting other post-secondaries across the country to do the same. There are similar programs being implemented in Ontario, Alberta, Saskatchewan and beyond. The SRC is not just a model for universities, but a model for all contexts and communities where harm reduction and sobriety coexist. Reach out to us, we're always happy to share more and thank you for having me and taking the time to listen. Thanks, Sarah, you're very inspiring. Um, talking about international uh, um, community, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Roberto um, Sassi, who is a Brazilian and actually also a, a, a newly implemented uh, uh, Vancouverite. Roberto, you uh, um, are uh, have the pleasure to uh, chair the uh, first keynote and uh, introduce uh, the, the speakers. Um, the floor is to you and thank you very much for, for joining us, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Good morning. And uh, thanks, Michael, Sarah, and the, the whole organizing committee of this very important conference. I'm, I'm Roberto Sass. I'm a child psychiatrist and the uh, current chief of psychiatry at BC Children and uh, Women's Hospital. Uh, I'm zooming in this morning uh, with gratitude from the ancestral and ceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Uh, and it's, it's my great pleasure today to introduce uh, our keynote speakers for this morning, Dr. Naschewski and Dr. Matthew. Uh, Dr. Martin Naschewski is a Harvard uh, and UCSF trained psychiatrist with a board certification in adult addiction and child adolescent psychiatry in Canada and USA. Uh, she's one of the only 100 uh, physicians uh, with this subspecialty training and clinical experience in the, in the US. She has received many awards and recognition for her clinical education, including the American Society of Addiction Medicine, Ruth Fox Scholarship Award, the American Academy of Child Adolescent Psychiatry Education Outreach Program Award for Child Adolescent Psychiatry Residents, and the Stuart Goldman of Psychiatry Education Award, among others. Uh, she now works uh, on the complex pain and addiction services at VGH, as well as her leading, uh, leading our substance use referral and facilitation service here at the BC Children and Women's Hospital. Currently, Dr. Naschewski is the education lead uh, for VGH uh, uh, complex pain addiction services and director of fellowship and off-service postgrad education for child adolescent psychiatry at uh, uh, BC Children's Hospital, which is related to her interest in medical education and working with learners across the education spectrum. Uh, desegmatization of addiction, the intersection between addiction and concurrent disorders, and providing an understanding about the developmental perspective and impacts of social determinants of health on substance use disorders are uh, key areas of focus uh, with learners and the clinical lead for Dr. Naschewski. Uh, Dr. Nick Matthew is the medical director for the complex mental health and substance use services with the BC Mental Health and Substance Use Services, uh, and his portfolio includes the Redfish Healing Center, uh, for Mental Health and Addictions, the Hardwood Center for Women, Ashnola at the Crossing, and the Coast Rehabilitation and Recovery. Uh, a psychiatry fellow at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada, Dr. Matthew completed an addiction psychiatry fellowship at Yale University and a forensic psychiatry fellowship at the University of British Columbia. He's board certified in addiction psychiatry, addiction medicine, and forensic psychiatry. Uh, he's also a clinical associate professor at the UBC and has won awards for teaching and research. And today, Dr. Naschewski and Dr. Matthew will be presenting on the topic of major trends in adolescent substance use on the background of the Canadian overdose disaster. Thank you very much, Dr. Naschewski and Dr. Matthew. Good morning uh, and uh, uh, salutations to everybody across the different time zones that we're presenting from this morning. Uh, I have the privilege as Dr. Sassy mentioned, to be talking with you this morning alongside Dr. Matthew about major trends in adolescent substance use in Canada on the background of the Canadian overdose crisis. Next slide. I'll be starting with a land acknowledgement, uh, recognizing that I'm presenting from the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Musqueam, uh, Squamish, and Salitude nations. Next slide. Over the course of my presentation, I will intend to provide you with a general overview of recent trends in youth substance use in Canada, focusing first on alcohol, cannabis, and nicotine, uh, 
and then transitioning to a focus on opioid trends, including usage and overdose rates in North America. And then I'm going to shift the focus and narrow things a little bit to British Columbia, uh, where I uh, work in practice and think some really vulnerable population. From there, I'll finalize rates of treatment for opioid disorder uh, in youth, and we'll summarize the presentation with some suggestions for improving care and treatment of this pop, uh, population before handing the podium off to Dr. Matthew. This was a big topic to fit into a brief presentation this morning, and I'd be pleased to uh, engage in, with interested individuals further outside of today's presentation. Next slide. It's well established that uh, the majority of individuals who go on to develop substance use disorders uh, start using substances in a uh, risky or potentially maladaptive pattern by the age of 18. As a child and adolescent psychiatrist with a particular focus in uh, uh, young, uh, youth and young adults, I view addiction as a developmental disease and that will be one of the uh, frameworks that I will use for the presentation. Next slide. The reason for that is because adolescence and young adulthood are key life stages where lifelong behaviors often become established. There are ongoing physical and social changes occur in the young brain uh, uh, as it grows with front, uh, back to front maturation, which um, allows for the development of future adult roles to be uh, uh, developed. And there is a focus actually on risk taking and independence as normal developmental milestones. This may present opportunities for risk taking, and during this time, many youth may experiment with substance use, and some may go on to do that in ways that are harmful to themselves or others. Uh, the uh, uh, corollary to having a particularly uh, plastic brain that is still in development is that access to treatment and support may be particularly effective in this youth population, particularly if we're able to intervene early. Next slide. So starting with the overview of youth substance use in Canada, compared to the general Canadian population, youth aged 15 to 24 have the highest rates of illicit substance usage. Put another way, 60% of illicit drug users in Canada are between the ages of 15 to 24. As I've mentioned, this is concerning because it's well established that early initiation of substance use before the age of 18 is associated with a 6.5 fold increased risk of developing a use disorder over time and the unfortunate recognition that less than 10% of youth receive appropriate substance use treatment. The more promising news, this isn't all, all uh, negative, the promising news is that research performed by Health Canada and consistent with, uh, with statistics in British Columbia and Ontario shows that youth substance use, including alcohol, nicotine, and cannabis, have been downtrending in recent years, as we see in the graph. In more recent years, however, particularly following the legalization and regulation of cannabis in 2018, there have been increases in cannabis use among all age ranges, but particularly in youth. And this likely relates to perceived rates of safety in youth uh, around cannabis usage associated with legalization, uh, which is associated with increased uptake of substances. Next slide. As we transition into a high level overview uh, uh, around the usage of prescription opioids in Canada, what we see is that this has actually declined for the first time by about 10% since 2012. And this is particularly important as the first wave driver of the opioid overdose crisis related to increased rates of prescribing of op prescription opioid medications by physicians, which increased by a factor of almost 40 over 10 to 15 years in Canada. So now we're starting to see that trend uh, slowly decreasing. Canada is the second largest consumer of prescription opioids in the world after the United States. Next slide. The next uplifting uh, uh, point I'm, I want to make is that non-medical use of opioids has also been decreasing in North American youth. So the average youth opioid uh, use rate in Canada is about 3%, and we see that this increases over time. So in students aged seven, uh, grades seven to nine, about 1.8% will use uh, pain uh, relievers for intoxication and not for medical purposes. There's been a small increase in that population. 
And uh, for youth in grades 10 to 12, that's, that increases to 4.7%. However, that number has remained relatively stable. We know that a greater proportion of males um, uh, may use substances compared to females. And the overall trend is that these numbers are down from much higher rates of up to 11 to 20% previously in some key demographic populations. As we see on the right-hand side graphs uh, in the uh, blue and uh, red, this data is consistent with youth trends in the United States as well that show that heroin and other narcotic use is actually decreasing as well. Across both countries, about 40 plus percent of students report obtaining these prescriptions uh, uh, and other medications from their parents. Next slide. Now here's where things take a turn. Despite the hopeful trends that use of alcohol, drugs and illicit substances has been decreasing in youth over time, there's been an alarming increase in hospitalization and overdose deaths, which leads us to today's conversation about youth overdose. The age group of 15 to 24 has experienced the fastest growing rates of hospitalization related to opioid overdoses between 2007 to 2016, and these rates continue to rise. During that period, about 50% of opioid overdoses among youth that led to hospitalization were intentional, uh, or overdoses that resulted as a uh, result of self-inflicted harm, and the remainder one were unintentional. Currently, about one in 20 hospital stays among youth aged 10 to 24 across Canada are related to harm caused by substance use. About 20% of these youth are currently hospitalized within the same calendar year. And for every single hospital stay, uh, there are approximately five visits to the emergency department as a result of substance use. Now, over time, this increased uptake in hospital visits has allowed uh, and, and forced healthcare providers to get better better at identifying these at-risk youth and provide accurate diagnoses. And so during this same timeline, opioid use disorder diagnoses have quadrupled in Canada from 2003 to 2017. Next slide. In the United States, we see the same trend. So the same time period, mortality from prescription opioids nearly doubled for youth and from heroin that increased fivefold. So these hospitalization and overdose deaths that represent the second increase in the opioid overdose crisis are driven by synthetic opioids such as fentanyl and carfentanil in the supply, as well as being adulterants in other drugs, which are much more potent and have higher likelihoods of fatalities. Next slide. I'm going to take a narrower focus on British Columbia, which is the uh, epicenter of the opioid overdose crisis in Canada. And what we see here is that over time in BC, youth have had a doubling of deaths uh, from opioid, uh, uh, sorry, from illicit drug use uh, between 2015 to 2016, again from 2016 to 2017, and now again from 20 to 21. And so what we see is that in fact, youth in BC account for almost 20% of all illicit opioid overdose deaths. And unfortunately, in British Columbia, we've reached other new and unfortunate milestones in that we experienced the youngest loss of life with a 12-year-old succumbing to opioid overdose at the age of 12 in April of last year. Next slide. As we try to better understand uh, these at-risk at populations, we know that overdose deaths occur more frequently in socially and economically disadvantaged groups of people. And on this slide, we uh, uh, recognize from BC coroner data that Indigenous youth who die of overdose are represented by a factor of 2.5 to fivefold compared to non-opioid individuals. And these trends are driven in part by higher rates of opioid usage in rural populations and in Indigenous youth, uh, in whom uh, prescription opioid use represents the second most frequently used substance after cannabis, and about 10% of Indigenous youth reporting prescription opioid use. But secondarily, there is less access to equitable and evidence-based treatment, and that leads to these unfortunate outcomes. Next slide. I'm going to briefly uh, mention other minoritized populations that are also overrepresented with the experience of harms and overdose deaths, including LGBTQ identifying populations, street youth, children of parents with substance use disorders, 
and those who have experienced significant adverse childhood experiences. Next slide. And so here we take a brief review of the substances that are implicated in youth deaths. And not surprisingly, in much the same way that we see in adults, it's the same substances that are putative in youth deaths. And so 85% of youth overdose deaths have fentanyl identified in toxicology, followed by cocaine, methamphetamine, and other opioids. However, youth are more likely to have mixed drug deaths on toxicology. Next slide. This is a slide that I'm hoping everybody on the call takes home with them today, in that although our, our ability to identify and diagnose opioid use disorder has improved over time, many of the youth who are seen in the emergency department or in hospital-based settings post-overdose may not receive diagnosis or appropriate treatment. Uh, I'm, I'm showing here a study from the United States that showed that after non-fatal opioid overdose, less than a third of youths received timely addiction treatment. Only one in 54, which is less than 2%, received evidence-based pharmacotherapy, which we know is one extremely important component of opioid use disorder treatment and is associated with retention and care, decreased rates of uh, ongoing illicit use and, and uh, uh, improved stability. And these rates are even lower in marginalized youth. So black youth are 42% less likely to receive medications for opioid use disorder and Hispanic youth 17%. So this tells us that interventions are urgently needed to link youth to treatment after overdose with priority placed on improving access to pharmacotherapy. But as the next couple slides will show, there's also a, a crucial importance of focusing on concurrent management of substance use disorders and psychiatric illness. Next slide. So you identify using substances for a number of reasons, similar to adults, to feel good, to be sociable, for the purposes of intoxication. However, others use to relieve stress and to cope with negative situations. And this group in particular is much, has a much higher propensity to experience negative health and social situations. Next slide. In the clinical population, we see that as many as 90% of adolescents with substance use disorders have co-occurring psychiatric conditions. So high rates of disruptive behavior disorders, such as untreated ADHD, depression, and anxiety. And this increases the risk of maladaptive use of substances. The uh, uh, bi-directional nature of this shows that at least 30% of adolescents admitted to inpatient psychiatric units meet criteria for at least one substance use disorder. And very, very few of them are, receive appropriate substance use diagnoses uh, by their outpatient treatment providers. Next slide. And that leads, leads to far reaching psychosocial, health, uh, uh, family, peer, legal, academic factors that will increase comorbidity and negative future outcomes. Next slide. This is the other slide that I'm hoping that individuals will, will take home with them today, um, in which I suggest some suggestions from my end for improving care and treatment in this population. I think firstly, our treatment focus needs to shift from uh, uh, management and secondary and tertiary care to prevention and early intervention. As I've talked about, the early adoption of substance use is associated with a wide range of deleterious health and social costs. I think that needs to occur through increased education, both within and outside of the healthcare system. So screening, comfort managing substance use needs to be ubiquitous in healthcare, a priority clinically and in training, and then to expand our systems of care uh, to include our community partners. And treatment needs to be low barrier, integrated with psychiatric care, and as Sarah was saying earlier, must engage youth and peers with lived experience. And this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but I hope a manageable starting point. And I will pass the uh, microphone on to Dr. Matthew, who will speak to some more of these principles of treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. I'm just gonna take a minute to set up my slides.
Sorry guys, I'm just having trouble setting up Zoom um, with the slideshow. And, and both Dr. Matthew and I have had some technical difficulties this morning. So we appreciate everybody's uh, patience as we get our slides up. Can you guys see my slides at this point? Okay. Uh, so Martha had a chance to uh, speak about the macro uh, version of what's going on. And I'm going to use a case uh, that I saw in um, Youth Corrections uh, to show what the background is and the development of substance use disorder. So we're gonna move from an international focus uh, back to a BC focus to the individual. Uh, so I don't have any conflicts of interest. Uh, I want you guys to understand the susceptibility of our patient population to overdose, understand the progression of the opioid use disorder, understand the need for concurrent treatment, and understand the interplay between trauma, socialization, psychiatric and substance use disorders in incarcerated youth. And um, we have an intervention called the Forensic Rapid Access Team uh, that might be a good model uh, for care uh, throughout the province. So this is looking at youth overdose deaths in, in British Columbia. I mean, the, the spiked in 2017, and uh, they, they dropped a little bit in 2019, but then uh, spiked again in, in 2020. So how does opioid use uh, disorder tend to progress? Well, people tend to start with non-medical prescription opioid use sometime around the age of 16. And then this becomes regular prescription opioid use just after the age of 18. Uh, they might start moving to illicit heroin uh, just after the age of 19. And they might first start engaging in treatment at that point. Shortly after, at the age of 20, they'll have their first overdose, start regularly using heroin, and then move on to injection heroin use. So there is a progression. When I was working in youth detox, most of the kids there were getting medications uh, from their parents' medicine cabinet. So uh, the most common one I saw was benzos, but this was generally how opioid use started uh, with young uh, people. So how do things look like for incarcerated youth in British Columbia? Uh, there's a high amount of physical and, and sexual abuse uh, for both uh, males and females. And there's also a large amount of mental health disorders and then substance use disorders. What's notable, notable is that for females uh, who are youth, so these are people under the age of 18, their co-occurrence of mental illness and substance use disorders is 100%. There wasn't one youth that didn't have both a mental health disorder and a substance use disorder. So I'm going to bring the focus on Jane Doe. Uh, her name has obviously been changed. Uh, this was someone that I saw in uh, custody, but it's to show the progression of, of addiction over time. So she, she was a female in her mid-teens. Uh, her father had a history of heroin use disorder. And at the time I saw her, she was currently estranged from her father. Her mother has a history of alcohol use and she has a tumultuous relationship with her mother um, as her mother was abusive when she was drinking. So she, she would often uh, beat her. Uh, Jane Doe had issues with her behavior since kindergarten when she spat on a teacher. She had issues with emotional regulation, would bang her head against the wall when frustrated in grade one. She was disinhibited, thrill seeking, uh, such as using substance use at a young age and running away from home. Uh, despite this, she was still an A and B student. Uh, so what I'd like you guys to take away is the potential for some of these kids. So some people would look at these kids and say uh, that there's nothing we can do. Um, they, they, they're, they're, they're not going to amount to anything anyways. But, but these kids have potential. And if we can intervene early, um, we, the good outcomes can occur. In the eighth grade, so at the age of 14, uh, she began to socialize with peers who were smoking cannabis daily. She dropped out of school in the eighth grade to spend time with her peers, and she started spending more time in uh, the Vancouver downtown east side. So just to get people who might not be from here um, up to speed about the downtown east side, uh, the BBC said it was home to one of the worst drug problems in North America. Uh, the population of the downtown east side is estimated to be around 18,500. Uh, there was a recent study that came out, the hotel study, that looked at uh, the co-occurrence of, of different illnesses in people in, in the downtown east side. And as you can see, 95% of people had a substance use disorder. 61% of people were using intravenous drugs. Uh, about half of them had psychosis. But the other interesting part was almost half of them had a diagnosable neurological disorder on MRI. So this can be the buildup of things like crystal meth use, 
um, also uh, anoxic brain injuries from, from overdoses. So going back to Jane Doe, uh, she was socialized to a group who regularly used fentanyl and crystal meth, GHB and cannabis, and started using all of these drugs soon after. Uh, prior to coming into custody, she was using 10 points of fentanyl. So one point is 0 0.1 grams of fentanyl. So she was using $110 daily. Um, she had been on Suboxone in the past, and her longest period of time on the medication was one month. Her highest dose was uh, 12 milligrams. And in addition, she was also using one point of crystal meth daily by smoking. So this cost about $30 a week. Now, this is a person who was not supported financially by her parents. So there's only a few things that a young person can do uh, to support their habit. The most common is theft. And this was something that, that she engaged in. Um, then there's drug dealing. Unfortunately, she did not have uh, the level, uh, the, the physical stature uh, to be successful in this trade. And um, the, the third is sex work. And, and this was what she engaged in. And this continuously uh, re-traumatized her uh, during her addiction. So she was, she was charged with assault with a weapon and theft under 5,000 uh, on two counts. And she was remanded to the inpatient assessment unit at the Youth uh, Forensic Psychiatric Services uh, for a bail assessment. And this is where I saw her. So on my first interaction with her, she presented with a runny nose, chills and flashes, uh, sweating. Uh, she refused Suboxone at the time as she did not want to get her doses of, of Suboxone at a pharmacy. Um, so I, I'll tell you what, what happened with this person, but this was someone in an acute withdrawal from, from opioids. So what were some of the challenges with her? Well, biologically, she had an op opioid use disorder with a physiological dependence to opioids shown by her withdrawal. She also had psychological issues with the history of thrill-seeking behavior, rule-breaking behavior, and trauma. Uh, from a social point of view, she had peers who used substances, and she was socialized to the downtown east side. Also, she has a history of lack of engagement uh, in psychiatric and, and substance use treatment. So I'm gonna digress and we'll, we'll get back to the case. Um, this was a paper that we published uh, looking at outcome trajectories of youth with uh, high-risk opioids use and uh, what were some of the findings that, that we came up with. So that paper came up with some treatment recommendations. Um, and as Martha mentioned, we recommended that youth um, with opioid use disorder uh, should be more readily offered opioid agonist therapy um, in pediatric primary care. The preliminary evidence suggests that the use of methadone and suboxone are uh, effective and safe in youth. So this isn't well studied, but this is the best evidence that we have. Also, we need, appropriately to, uh, we need to appropriately integrate so psychosocial interventions into the continuum of care for youth. Uh, and this can be an effective way of addressing psychiatric conditions and emotional drivers of substance use, leading to improved re retention and treatment trajectories. Uh, so if you take outside of our incarcerated youth, the range of people with psychiatric comorbidities and the opioid use disorder was 50 to 90%, depending on which study you looked at. So what is the evidence for this? This was a study in 2018 out of Ontario, and it looked at the, the co-occurrence of psychiatric disorders and uh, substance use disorders treated in Ontario. And they treated people who were in opioid agonist therapy clinics with psychiatric care. And what they found was that uh, in both Northern and Southern Ontario, there was a reduction in ER visits as well as hospitalizations. Also in Southern Ontario, there was a reduction in all cause mortality. So this can be from suicides, this can be from overdose. Uh, so if, if our concern is to keep these patients alive. We really need to have concurrent disorders as a key. So what we did in um, the forensic system is we managed her uh, with the, the FRAP team, the Forensic Rapid Access Transition Team. Uh, in there, we had nursing to screen and initiate um, the, this patient. Uh, we had psychiatrists trained in addiction to manage with medications. So we actually got her on Sublicade so that she wouldn't have to go to the pharmacy every day. This is an injectable form of Suboxone and you could take the medication once a month. We also had psychologists uh, to treat her impulsivity and also her trauma related events um, and also connect her to psychological services in the forensic continuum in the community. Also we had social work to assess and treat social issues and also to collect, connect her to social services in the community. 
Uh, this was all done under legal framework. So we had a lot of resources uh, available to, to treat this person. And this does sound like a lot of resources. And, and I could see a lot of people in the audience thinking, well, we, we don't have those kind of resources. Um, but just to provide some perspective, this is a look at COVID deaths versus uh, overdose deaths in 2021. Uh, green is COVID and, and orange is, is overdoses. And as you can see, there's a lot more overdose deaths than COVID deaths, but we were managed to rearrange society and spend massive amounts of resources towards COVID. Um, if we could divert some of those resources to uh, the opioid overdose crisis, uh, I think we can make an impact uh, going forward. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Matthew and uh, Dr. Ashevsky. Um, we have a, a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, we have to end at 10 past the hour. I'm just wondering if uh, if people have uh, uh, had any questions asked on the, the Zoom chat or the, the Hoover uh, website. If not, I can start with uh, one quick question until we wait for someone else to, to put a question in there. So I, I have a question, Dr. Ashevsky, where you mentioned the, the study from the US data. Uh, with the very low rates uh, of a youth uh, after a known fatal overdose being referred to actual evidence-based treatments. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering two things. I mean, if, um, if we have any similar kind of data uh, here in Canada, and two, what can we do as healthcare providers to change those numbers to, to, to make this better? Yeah, thanks. Great question, Dr. Sassy. So um, I, I use that study because it's, it is one of the um, uh, representative studies uh, that we use to sort of better understand the uptake of treatment of care in the post-overdose setting. There is some evidence from Canadian populations and in British Columbia that we look at similar, if not lower, rates of access to treatment in, in youth in BC and uh, further, as I mentioned, lower rates in uh, um, uh, marginalized or, or racialized uh, youth like Indigenous populations. And, and, and that is in keeping with just the general trend that uh, access to sub subspecialty substance use disorder care is very limited in North America. Um, it's something that um, uh, has, is a relatively newer topic of conversation uh, and recognition of treatment. And so there's relative discomfort and uncertainty in the US, there's uh, also some uh, different challenges that we have around the use of uh, opioids and other opioid agonist therapy for youth under the age of 18, where uh, harm reduction may not be as much of a uh, priority treatment as it is, for example, in British Columbia. I think from my end, the biggest way that we combat this, uh, one of th this is a challenge is, is through education. Uh, so I think increased awareness is absolutely crucial. And so that's why I'm so grateful to individuals like Dr. Krauss and everybody else that's uh, involved in the com uh, in developing the conference, and as well as the global attendants who are interested in learning more about this and can be champions uh, to uh, bring back the concepts learned here and to think about things like universal Screening, particularly for particularly uh, for uh, vulnerable youth who may have particular risk factors, et cetera. And that is, I think, a place to start and then increase access to treatment. And really, I think this needs to be a very bottom up approach where our learners need to develop increased comfort um, and drive that increased awareness importance uh, uh, for uh, older generations of providers in the hospital setting. And I think also as I mentioned, engaging our, our youth and uh, peer experts with lived experience to think about how we actually uh, identify these individuals if they aren't presenting to care and we think we aren't seeing them. Thank you, Dr. Maschewski. We, we have a, a question for the audience to Dr. Matthew, which is just wondering where the Jane Doan case is right now, uh, if you could explain the outcome uh, and uh, and what will happen with that uh, with her. Uh, so Jane Doe, has become less chaotic over time. So uh, she, she did come back in uh, with some charges. She did have some relapses, but uh, she found housing in, in the Valley. So away from the downtown east side and uh, she engaged in um, horse, horse therapy. And uh, this was something that, that she really loved and um, the relapses have decreased. Uh, she's, she's become a, a lot more stable now. She hasn't had um, an overdose since I've seen uh, since I saw her at the bail assessment, and uh, she's connected to our Langley Clinic right now. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. And thank you, Dr. Narshevsky. We, we have to wrap things up and, uh, and apologize for, for not being able to answer the, the other questions here. The speakers are going to be available through the Hoover app, so you can uh, um, send the, your questions directly to, to them. And I'll ask uh, all the audience uh, uh, to take a 10-minute break and then join us again for the workshops at um, uh, 20 past the hour. Uh, and uh, if you have not registered for any workshops uh, yet, you can do that through the, through the website uh, for both the workshops and the lightning talks. So thanks again, Dr. Mishevsky and Dr. Matthew for the fantastic presentation. Have a good day, everyone.